Well, hey guys, it is seven o'clock on a beautiful Wednesday night. I hope you're doing good wherever you're at today. Uh, been looking forward to doing this for a while, getting back into doing some of the different uh, Facebook lives, diving inside of the word. And uh, anyway, so before I get started, let's give you the rules, all right? For the mere fact that I can't hear you, Amens or thumbs up, their hearts, their, if, if I say something you disagree with, there's a thumb mark there, don't use that. No, I'm just kidding. If I say something, man, that you're going, ah, Scott, I got a question mark, hit the thumbs up. In fact, just go ahead and practice. I saw somebody already hit it. Go ahead and practice it right now. Just give me a couple of amens, a couple of, hey, man, we're here, a couple of heart. Uh, there you go. Okay, good. Good to see some friends here already chiming in, man, from uh, just last couple of months and the last couple of years. It's so good to have different people chiming in. Um, those of y'all who don't know, I got I to gotta get this out of the way just, just very quick. Um, yeah, so our eldest son, those of y'all that know the Crenshaws, we've got our three children and we've got our oldest two who are married and we have been talking, asking, wanting to know when the Crenshaws were going to be expanding into the grandparent world. Well, we got the we got the message, we got the word, and it's being publicly released. Ben and Becca are uh, are expecting, and so this is the first Crenshaw grandbabies showing up, and so we're extremely excited. Now, seriously, somebody needs to be giving me some some thumbs up, some hearts on that one, man. That's 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 a pretty cool thing. We're we're totally stoked about it, and so thank you very much for that. Th okay, thank you, Hallelujah. I see that hand, and so a uh, Beck is doing great, awesome, awesome girl. Could not love that girl anymore. We're so proud of both of them. The baby's going to be due probably the first part of March. There we go. Now we're jumping in. Um, and people have asked me, man, Scott, A, are you ready for this? And B, what are they, what's the kid going to call you? Uh, a, I'm not really ready for this, to be honest with you. And so when the kids ask me, what would you like the grandchildren to call you? I was like, Mr. Crenshaw? So... I already got it trumped, and this is the official name. In fact, I didn't even know it when I grabbed the coffee mug tonight. It's got uh, scripture on the other side and pops on this one. So here's that. We're excited. We're excited about the Crenshaw household expanding. And, uh, yeah, it's a pretty exciting thing. So anyway, can I tell you this? Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Um, each month... I take a different book of the Bible and desire to just really suck the marrow out of it. And, and here's why. If we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, part of that, part of being a disciple is, is discipline, is learning the different disciplines. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you, if you're not spending time inside of this book, um, you're not walking in the way that God's created you to. This, this book is to enlighten us, it's to give us direction, it's to give encouragement. So many people right now that, that you tell me if I'm missing this, you're saying, man, I need encouragement and I need to hear from God. And I would ask you this question, are you spending time in this book? Because there's encouragement in here, there's direction in here, there's insight inside of this book. And we as children of God need to be people of this book. Um, when you look at it, don't just look at it as the history of Israel. Don't look at it as a 2,000-year-old manuscript. Look at it as a, as a love letter. Um, it's a GPS. God is, it's a story. It's an incredible story, old and new. I get some of these people will say, well, you know, I'm just a, a New Testament believer. No, no, you, you, you're a biblical um, believer. And we need the old and the new. The old is was, was the signposts. There were promises there that were fulfilled in Christ. In the Old and New Testament, let me just give you this real quick. The Old and New Testament, it's an incredible story. It's, it's the story of, of man. It's the story of God and the relationship that together. And to be able to embrace the fullness of the story is to be able to be students of the book, of both the Old and the New Testament. 
And so I would tell you this, you know, um, you may sit there right now and say, well, you know, Scott, I'm not, I'm not really a theologian. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Because the minute that you opened your mouth and said the word God, you became a theologian. The moment that you said God, because the word theology, God, theos, uh, ology, to study, the moment that you said the, the moment you said God, you became a theologian. Here's the only question. Are you a good one or not? My desire is I want to see you become a good one. Not only do I want to see you be a good theologian, because I'll, I'll throw this out also. In today's society where it seems like so many churches are about and I'm saying this out of pure love, but out of a little bit of anger and, and somebody that's been in doing this for 30 years, where so many churches can be so wrapped up in filling the church. They can be so wrapped up in entertaining the people so that they can fill up the church. If the goal is to fill up the church, you're, we're missing it. We're missing it. What we've got to be doing is it's not to fill up the church. It's to fill up the people with God. And to be able to do that, we've got to be able to know this book. This is the this is the plumb line. I know this is a big intro for all this, but it's just it's really something heavy on my heart. I think there are so many of the young churches that are not te teaching deeper theology, uh, and they're also not they're not teaching the difficult things. Um, they're not talking about, well, what does the Word of God say about abortion? What does it say about homosexuality? What does it say about these different issues? And a lot of times, if the goal of a church is to fill the seats, then they're going to avoid the difficult uh, conversations. And that's not who we need to be. We need to be able to tackle all the difficult issues, all the, the, the deeper theology. All right, so can we do this? Take your book, man. Can I just pray over you real quick? Can I, can I do that? Father God, in the name of Jesus, for those that are watching, those that are watching again, those that are listening in car or on the treadmill, whatever, Father, I just pray right now that um, you would unleash your word. I pray that you would hide me behind your cross. Just totally get me out of the way. You receive, Master, all the glory. So, Father, today I don't have to do anything except unleash your word and Father, you be God. Jesus, you, you are the word made flesh, and we thank you. Reveal yourself. Reveal yourself to us today. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. So, I hope you got your Bible. I hope you got uh, something to write with, because, baby, we're going to dive into some stuff. Um, again, man, seeing more new people chime in. So glad to have you guys. Thank you all so much for spending some time with me. But we're going to dive into the book of Esther, all right? Esther, um, just a few short chapters, but an incredible book. Um, first off, let me tell you a little bit about Esther, all right? This book, this book, nowhere in this book does it refer to prayer. Nowhere does it refer to faith. Nowhere does we do we see the words, the law, written. In fact, can I tell you this? None of the New Testament writers ever even mentioned Esther. It's not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Martin Luther himself said that he wished the book had never been written. It's actually one of two books that don't even mention the name God. Stay with me. Even though it doesn't mention the name God, it does mention the king, Xerxes, we'll talk about him in a little bit, mentions him 175 times. But understand this, God is the main character throughout the entire book, even though his name never appears. God is in the book. He's just not overtly seen. Um, I love this quote by John Darby, one of my uh, favorite commentary study guys. He said this, and, and please grab hold of this one. I'm telling you, this is a tweetable moment right here. God's ways are behind the scenes. But God moves behind the scenes in which he is behind. I got to give that to you again because that's too much fun. God's ways are behind the scenes, but God moves the scenes in which he is behind. God, I love that. What we're going to end up seeing here in the book of Esther, what you're going to see here is you're going to see the word providence. You're going to see providence take place. Uh, God takes the natural, and he uses it in the supernatural uh, so that all things 
work together for the good, right? Matthew Henry, another one of my favorite commentary guys, said, said it this way. He said, God's name is not in it, but his hand is in it. And you're going to see that less left and right. What does the name Esther mean? Esther, the, the word Esther means star. Uh, in Hebrew, it means myrtle. Um, we, we don't actually know who the author of this book is. It's probably not Esther. It could be Mordecai. It could be Ezra. We don't really know on that. So, this is a story of a young Jewish girl who is elevated to the queen in a pagan court for a specific assignment. Now, let me give you this. I've got to give you the history. You've got to be able to understand the history to be able to really grasp what's taking place here. All throughout the Old Testament, people would love God. They would turn their back on God. Love God, turn their back on God. Wow, sounds like our society today. Another sermon. What God continued to do while the people were turning their backs on God, God spoke to them and said, I discipline those I love. I discipline those I love. And I want you to hear that. God still does that today. If you're going through, you may be going through a disciplined time. You may be going through a time where, where Father is refining you. Can I just give you this one good word? Listen to me. This one good word. He only disciplines sons and daughters. Grab that. If you are going through discipline right now, and Father does discipline, but he disciplines only his sons, his daughters. So in the Old Testament, what you had happening, large period where the people's hearts were hardened toward God. And God continued to tell them through the prophets, I'm, I'm going to take you through a time of discipline. I'm going to take you through a time of discipline. And what that discipline looked like was, it looked like uh, the children of Israel would be taken into captivity. They'd be taken out of Jerusalem. They'd be taken into Babylon. And there they would be held in what's called the Babylonian captivity. Now, I'll take you to another guy, Daniel. All right, In the book of Daniel, Daniel is one of those guys who is in, taken out of Jerusalem, taken into Babylonian captivity, and there he's sitting under the king, pagan king named Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he's the guy in charge. He's the guy in charge. So Nebuchadnezzar does this. He's, he's Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in that dream, uh, he dreams to which Daniel comes in and gives him the interpretation. He has this dream. Many of y'all remember the dream. It's a dream of this, this statue, and the statue's head was made of gold. Its chest and arms were made of silver. Its midsection was made of bronze. His legs, both legs, were made of iron, and his feet were uh, iron and rock. Now, he asked Daniel, what does this dream mean? Daniel came to him and he said, look, God has given me the interpretation for the dream, and here it is. He said, these are the different kingdoms that are going to rule. Right now, King Nebuchadnezzar, you, you're the Babylonian king. You're the, the golden head. And that was, that was the Babylonian rule. The silver with the arms and chest, that was the Persian Mede Empire. They would be next. Not as strong, but still beautiful and very powerful. The group that's going to come in and take over, the world leaders at that point, after the Persian Mede. So you got... Babylon, Persian, Medes, and the midsection was the Greeks. The Greeks are going to come in. And then finally, after the Greeks, were going to be the legs, which were made of iron, and that was going to be Romans, east, west. So now you've got a picture of not only the empires, but these are also going to be the people that will rule over the Jews. So now you've got a little bit of idea of what's taking place here. If I could break down the book of Esther. If you got your notes, I break it down into three sections. And I got this from a, from a friend of mine. I love how he broke it down. Chapters one and two are supernatural providence. Okay. Chapters one and two, supernatural providence. Chapters three through five, what those are going to be is satanic plot. Three through five, satanic plot. And then six through 10 is going to be sovereign protection, sovereign protection. Now, what I do want you to be able to see is, without this, already the Jews 
have been released, all right? They've been released from Babylonian captivity because now we're in the Persian era. The Persians have already released them. Jews, majority of the Jews have, have gone back. They've gone back to Jerusalem. But what you've got here is you've got about a million Jews who have stayed there with the Persian Empire. Now, what's so special about the book of Esther is nobody else, we wouldn't have any idea what life was like for the Jews uh, who remained in the Persian Empire had it not been for the book of Esther. And so what we're looking at is this. We're looking at about 50 million people are a part of the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire lasted for about 200 years, and then they would end up turning it over to the Greeks. So that gives you kind of a little bit of an outline of what's taking place here. Um, we start off and we start reading this. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. Now, Xerxes, uh, Hasuerus is, is probably the name that some of y'all have in your Bible, Hasuerus. His other name was, was Xerxes. And at the time of Xerxes, who his dad was, I don't know if you care about this, I'm going to give it to you anyway, because we're studying the book. And listen to, listen to me, you're students of the Word. You're students of the Word. You may sit here and say, Scott, I've never been a student of the Word. Well, welcome. Welcome to Class 101. You're a student of the Word. Xerxes, Xerxes is the dad of a guy named Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is going to be the guy who sends Nehemiah back to Jerusalem so that he can rebuild the wall, all right? Uh, Xerxes, the name means uh, lion. It means mighty man. Um, his grandfather, in fact, he's the grandson. Xerxes is the grandson of Cyrus the Great. Um, and by the way, Cyrus the Great was the Persian who released all the Jews, okay? Um, Nehemiah went back under Artaxerxes, but he was specifically sent. Nehemiah was part of some of the guys who stayed there under the Persian rule. You with me? So Cyrus the Great released everybody. Xerxes is here right now with Esther. Artaxerxes is going to be with Nehemiah. There we go. Love it. You're a student of the word already, man. Let's continue in this. So the year is about 483, 483 BC. All right. And I'm just going to take a few more minutes. That's all we're going to do for tonight, all right? But it, but it says this, that Xerxes was there, and he threw a party, all right? Now, I know some of you guys, because I've been with you, you know how to party. Uh, but this was a six-month party, a six-month party. Now, let me help you understand why Xerxes was throwing a six-month party. Most historians believe that he's throwing the six-month party to bring in all of these other military leaders to try to get everybody on the same page because follow this right babylon that's already passed you got P uh, Mede persian empire who's coming up next who's coming up next yeah it's the greeks the greeks are coming up next well guess what's already happening greeks are already starting to rumble battles are already starting to take place and xerxes part of the persian Mede empire xerxes is already having to go off to battle he's having to spend that money he's having to work with these guys he's having a six-month party right now and he's bringing all these generals all these leaders in he's trying to get everybody on the same page you with me on that so we got this six-month party now who are some of the people that are at this party one of the individuals is going to be at this party is going to be Philip. Stay with me. Stay with me. Philip is with the Greeks. Philip is going to be a key player. He's going to rise up, and he's going to have a son named Alexander. And Alexander the Great is going to be the one who takes over midsection, the bronze, the Grecian period. Babylonian, Persian, Mede, the Greeks. We got a six-month party going on. Philip, Alexander the Great's dad, is at the party. So they party for about six months. After six months, everybody goes home. Well, he's now, Xerxes, King Xerxes, is wanting to thank all the people that helped put the party on, right? So he has another seven. He has another week-long uh, celebrations, another seven days just to thank everybody for coming out and helping with the party. So everybody goes home. The big group goes home. Everybody who helped put the party on, they're going to stay around. 
So they're now partying. Party is going on. The king, Xerxes, has got a wife, of course. You're a king, you gotta have a queen. Queen's name, Vashti. Vashti. Persian culture, the men and women didn't party together, right? The men had their party over here, the women had their party over here. The men are over here, they can do whatever they want. They can burp, scratch, they can be guys, right? The women, I, I don't know what women do at their party. They're, they're doing essential oils and Tupperware. I, 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 please do not email me for that response. But the women are, and men are partying separately. All of a sudden, Xerxes says to his attendants, send for my wife, send for Vashti, bring her over here with the boys. Now, as a guy, let me tell you what's going on. Homeboy Xerxes is here with all of his buddies. They're hanging out. They're talking smack. It's locker room talk. He's got a beautiful wife named Vashti. He wants to bring her over, not just because she's gorgeous, but he wants to show her off. I mean, she's a tro it's obvious she's a trophy wife, right? But he wants to bring her over also because she is adorned in all of her garment, all of her, her, her crowns and her jewels and the flowing robes. So he wants to bring her over. Hmm. Let's look at Vashti for just half a second. Vashti is not a rags to riches girl. Vashti comes from royalty. In fact, Vashti's grandfather was King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, Daniel. Homegirl, I'm sure, I'm sure that Xerxes is saying, you know, get my girl over here. And Vashti's going, it just ain't happening. I'm sure major face embarrassment to King Xerxes. He was embarrassed by this. He, he had to be. So not only was he embarrassed in front of all of his guests, but there was not only embarrassment, but there was also going to be fear. Fear of what? Fear that the queen, if the queen said no to the king, what does that say to the rest of the country? What does that say to the over 120 providences of Persia? What does that say to the women? And so for the king, he, he got fear. Now, that was the Persian culture. It wasn't the Jewish culture. This was the Persian culture. He was scared. He was embarrassed. He was scared. So he got his people together. He got his advisors together, and he began to talk to them. And he said, dude, what do we need to do about this? I mean... Not only did I get embarrassed, but what if word gets out about this and every woman married causes a revolt? So they decided to do this. In the Persian culture, they simply dismissed Vashti, gave her a, a different role, removed her from her seat as a queen. You just got chapter one. How about that? We just went through chapter one. Okay. Okay. Chapter two. Next week, we're going to dive into chapter two, okay? And uh, if everything works out, I, I plan on being back here Wednesday night, seven o'clock. You guys good with that? Did anybody get anything out of this tonight? Was there anything that you went, oh, dude, I didn't know that. Okay. Anybody? Okay. Give me some thumbs up. They, okay. Good, good, good. Let me give you this before we leave. Chapter one. We just finished chapter one. And what we saw was we saw Xerxes. We saw him in the order of uh, what's taken place historically. We saw that he threw a party, invited his wife to come over. And um, man, is that is that not the story? Is that not the Shakespeare story of the taming of the shrew? Okay, it's been a long time since I've been in reading Shakespeare, but is that not the story of the taming of the shrew? The king's there, he's got a big party going on, he tells his wife to come over and there's embarrassment and everything. Anyway. Somebody tell me, somebody drop me a line and tell me if that's the story of the taming of the shrew. So he dismisses Vashti, chapter one. Now watch this, watch this. Because it's not, I'm, I'm gonna get, ha, you're gonna love this. I'm gonna give you something that's not even in the text, but it's in the history books. Chapter one, we just finished chapter one. Between chapter one and chapter two, something powerful happened. I told you that already the Greeks were starting to rise up. The Greeks were already 
starting to have their little revolts, their little fights. Well, in between chapter one, when he gets rid of, when Xerxes gets rid of Vasti, in chapter two, and we'll dive into that next week, there's a battle that takes place. There's a small group of Greeks, and what they're doing is uh, they're starting to uprise. And so Xerxes loads up his team, uh, gets all of his people, all of his boats together. They go over to show these Greeks who's really in charge here. The beautiful thing is, the beautiful thing that you're going to see is, is simply this, that, um, that fight that, you, that I'm talking about. That's the fight that the movie 300 was from. And in that fight, what you ended up seeing was the Persian Mede Empire, even though they were showing their mass strength in numbers, the Greeks would begin to show their mass strengths by focusing on the individual. We're going to talk about that a little bit more next week. And then we're also going to actually introduce you to Mordecai. And we're going to introduce you for the first time to Esther. How did this little girl go from rags to riches? Hey guys, thank you, thank you again for real. Thank you guys again for for chiming in. If it's been good for you, um, I hope you'll hit the share button. Let other people know that we're doing this. We're gonna send out the event thing and think about it. Drop my boy Ben, man, a little congratulatory high five. But I love you guys. Thank y'all again. It's so good seeing all. Oh, thank y'all. It's so good, man, seeing all the faces and all the names. And man, I look forward to getting to talk to everybody soon. Blessings to you. You, you, you were created for a time such as this. God bless.